Prosecutor says, I, I don't know. I didn't see what happened. You didn't see what happened? What? Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. Today we have a really fun story about how to avoid being recognized in court. So right at the beginning of COVID, somebody had sent me this video and it was of a girl who put on a surgical mask. She put makeup all over it and she turned it into her face and it looked so good. And the challenge was for me to do that or I made myself the challenge. And what I did was I kind of told part of this story while I was turning that mask into my face because I was masking myself the way that supposedly mm. you are masking yourself in court. But while I have you here, and this kind of just came, while I have you here, like you're going anywhere. No! <laughs> we were just telling the story in another video about, sort of about the same topic. I would love for you to tell the story in more detail, but I will link that video up there because it was a really fun video to make. All right, so, you know, basically when you're getting ready for trial, uh, there's all sorts of you know, threats that the government makes and they say, man, we have all these people that are going to come in here and they're going to testify that they saw you or they're going to point the finger at you. And to be honest, leading up to this trial process, they had given us all just boxes of paperwork that had to do with the grand jury, people being called in there, Ooh. asked for information. But what was missing from our case was the identifications. You know, the thing was, there were no in-person identifications, no where, you know, like you see on TV, line up six people in a room and you stand behind the glass and people come in and go, yeah, it was that guy. None of that ever happened. The other way, which you've probably also seen on TV, is what's called a photo array. Yep. And they have the books and it's all these pictures in them. Now, there's very, very clear, long established Supreme Court law that says the standards, how you have to conduct these sorts of in-person or photo array lineups. Wow. Like that's very well established within the law. There's no gray area there. And it makes sense because people could say whatever they want to say. Well, there's so much, and especially now, more and more information's coming out about misidentifications and people's memories just aren't. That was in the show for life too. I actually went into that on a video as well, how psychologically they set you up yes. when you do those lineups, but I don't want to get too derailed, but sure. that is in a video that I talked about. I'll link it up there if I can find it. Okay. Back then I didn't know all the science behind it or anything like that. What I did know was one, they don't want to identify us. And two, I don't think that they can. Now, let me just be clear. I've already admitted that I committed all my crimes. And there were other things too that I wasn't even charged with. I admit that. You admitted that? No, you no, admit no, no, no. that now. I admit that Got now. It. It's like, what a stupid <laughs> criminal. <laughs> I admitted everything you didn't know too. You no, know, obviously we're fighting all of this. And one of the things that comes to light is, man, there's no identifications without anyone who can actually say, yes, it was them. Things become sticky real quick. Like, where's your case? What is this predicated upon? Especially because most of these people, most of our crimes were not reported when they happened. It was after the fact, after these guys began cooperating, they had to go back and establish the crimes and, and link us to them. So everything was working backwards here, right? And the identifications obviously were a difficult part of that. They had some real challenges in front of them. And if you know anything about the federal system, they have a 98% conviction rate. So oh God. It's probably even higher than that. The reason for that is because everybody cops out, you know? Well, why wouldn't you at this point if you have the trial penalty and that's another video in itself, but. Trial penalty. And they tell you, listen, if you take this to trial, we're going to give you life <laughs> or you can cooperate with us and be out quick which in all honesty, that's what most people do. And hey, I'm not here to make judgments on those people because that's a reality. And you can't say what you would do 
facing a life sentence, genuinely facing a life sentence. You can say how you would like to respond. Sure. But I'm going to tell you from my experience and from what I've seen, you know, in 20 plus years in the system, what you would like to do in theory is a whole lot different than what happens in real life. And I think that's why two things. First of all, I think this is a whole different video in itself, but I think that's why those prison politics, those old school prison politics on if you cooperate and paperwork and all that stuff are so blurred at this point. Point. And sure. number two, question, if you had to do it all over again, knowing you'd be inside for those 20 plus years, would you go to trial? Or yes. would you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can get into that in another we'll do video. that another time. Yeah. Back okay. to these identifications. So uh, we're getting ready to go to court, right? And I'm like, man, they don't have anything. You know what they have? They have two people, our cooperating co-defendants who... If you've been following us, previous videos, you already know, these are guys that I met while I was doing time in the state prison on a previous case. That's right, I did time previously, 18 to 21, 22. And these two guys are guys that I was with in that prison who sought me out once I was on the outside. I've told tidbits of that in the past. It was a really hard story to tell because while Adam was inside, we just kind of looked like jaded people who were trying to lie his way out. Sure. And it wasn't like that at all. So if you missed that, it's not because I hid that from you or anything like that. It's because I could only touch on that so much before I looked, one, like I was crazy, two, like we were trying to lie his way out, or three, in my opinion, worst of all, he was trying to pull the wool over my eyes and lie to me just to get me to kind of blindly follow his lead. But yes, that's the truth. Yeah. With the identifications and us, you know, getting ready for trial, focusing really just on these two guys, the two cooperating co-defendants, uh, felt pretty confident that we'd be able to go in there and attack the identification component to this case. And maybe, maybe even get, you know, that aspect of it thrown out. And then the government's really, our hope was to put them in a bind and they'd have to come back and say, well, you know, here we got a great deal. Just take the deal. Or even better, we'd ultimately just win that trial, right? So that's the thinking going into this. Now, I've read through all this, these stacks of testimony. Of people went in front of the grand jury. The only way that these people were able to identify any one of us was because they took a picture and it was a Polaroid picture and it had a number on it. it. Wasn't my prison number or anything. Honestly, I don't know what the number was. Significance, just my picture, right? Each one of us as co-defendants. They put it in front of them and said, on this day at this time when this robbery occurred, wasn't this individual, Mr. Adam Clausen, the one who came in and did this, this, and this. They just took my picture. I was charged, they put my picture and said, isn't this the person who did it? Basically pointing the finger. Now, that's not legal. You, that's not a legal identification. If they had previously done the in-person lineups, the photo lineups, then they could come in and do this. But they didn't, none wow. of that existed. So technically now you have prejudiced us, by putting my photo in front of them without doing, going through that procedure. So that's technically, it's not legal, right? So we're like, man, there's no way this stuff is gonna stand. So we go in prior to our trial, we have the judge holds a hearing, and this is to get all the identifications, to get all this testimony thrown out. They're not gonna be able to present this. We go through all of this, and here's what comes out of it. It looks like we're gonna win this, right? The judge at the end of the day, says, you know, this is compelling testimony. It seems like he's leaning in our favor. The attorneys are high-fiving behind us like, we got this. It's the first ray of hope that anyone's seen, that anybody's feeling good about this. And the judge says, but you know what? Let me go back. I'm gonna sit on this overnight. Let me look at some case law. Come back in the morning, I'll give you my ruling. So the following morning when we come back in the court, you know, we're excited. We're thinking, hey, the judge is leaning our way. Like things are looking good, right? Judge says, I'm denying the motion. We're moving on. No further commentary. We're like, what? That's it? The attorneys are baffled. He's like, moving on. We're picking the jury. 
I said, oh man. He said, going forward, he said, we're just gonna assess each witness as they come in to determine you know, whether or not they can go ahead and make the identification in court. Who paid him off overnight? I don't know what happened, but the law is very clear. Like what they did was, wasn't legal. Uh, no way that any of that should have stood. So what ultimately comes out is when we start getting these witnesses to come in, I've read the grand jury testimony. They're supposed to get up on the stand and say, he did it, right? Well, there's one person in particular, this guy that's, he's an admitted drug addict. He's in bad shape. He's in bad shape when he comes into court, mm -hmm. has basically admitted that he's, he's been using, right? So immediately his credibility is in question. He happens to be connected to the, the guy whose story that he's coming in here to support is somebody who's known to be a supplier in the community. Mm. So strange relationship, right? Obviously there's, there's some clear invested interest here, but this guy gets up on a stand and <clears throat> as he's up there, he's telling the story of supposedly the time that he spent with me face to face like this. And the prosecutor says, can you positively identify this person for us right now, right here in court today? He says, yes, absolutely. It was him right there. I turn, I look, I'm like, who's he pointing at? He's pointing at my other co-defendant who's not even charged in this crime. You're like, yes. I'm like, what, did you see this? And didn't his attorney like jump up? My attorney's in shock. He's like, uh, what's going on here? Frozen. My co-defendant's attorney, whom he just pointed at, jumps up. And this guy's shooting me some bail because he's like, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <laughs> I don't know what this guy is talking about, but my client's not even charged in this crime. So I don't know why he's pointing at him. Which is point, ironic because wasn't he like your biggest frenemy? Yeah. <laughs> so after the attorney points to the jury, explains this isn't my client, the judge looks up over it with a banister and says, Mr. Prosecutor, like what's going on here? Now, if you read this on the transcript, and anyone who's done any legal work knows that transcripts do not, do not accurately reflect what is happening in the courtroom. Really? Not even close. What you read, there's so much under, uh, so much that's conveyed there that's just not even a part of the record. See, we're always taught like it's verbatim, yeah. it's an unbiased person just typing away. <gasps> wow, learn something new every day. Not even close. The judge looks at the prosecutor, what's happening here? The prosecutor says, I, I don't know, I didn't see what happened. You didn't see what happened? What? Everybody who was in the courtroom saw this guy point at my coat of Ah, the irony here, go ahead. Yes. So the prosecutor approaches. He says, oh, Your Honor, can I approach? Goes up and approaches the, the uh, witness who's up on the stand and says, Mr. So-and-so, are you sure? And he's like, uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Oh, so now you're not sure. He says, no, 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 no. He says, well, would you like to come down <gasps> and take a walk in front and get a closer look at the defendant? He says, yes, Your Honor, I'd like to do that. So now he comes down off the stand. Stumbles around, I'm sure. Walks past us. It's myself, my two co-defendants, and each of our attorneys. So there's six of us, plus a whole gang of U.S. Marshals around us, right? That's <laughs> the additional security. And walks by, looks at each one of us up close. Walks through and he goes, no, Your Honor. He goes, I, I can't make an identification right now. He goes, he goes, I'm, I'm just not sure. The guy who two minutes ago was absolutely positively certain and pointed to my co-defendant now doesn't know, right? Because he can't remember who he was paid off to say. So he goes back up to the stand and the prosecutor says, Your Honor, I would like to submit that Mr. Clausen has so dramatically changed his appearance that as a result, Mr. So-and-so is not able to positively identify him today, but he should, or we should be able to introduce the fact that previously in the grand jury room, he was able to positively identify Mr. Clawson from his photo. Not a photo array, not an in-person lineup, 
from one photo that they put in front of them. underneath it. Ah. Let me show you the disguise that I had on that day. Take notes, because please. Because these glasses, yeah, they survived all those years in prison. These are the glasses that I was wearing in court that day that so dramatically changed my appearance. And I might have had a little bit more facial hair than I have right now. But clearly you can see, it's not like I grow much facial hair, so it's still very light. Little bit of facial hair. They said that that had so dramatically changed my appearance. That it so dramatically changed my blood pressure. Let me just hold up one second. I've heard this story a million times. I'm being dramatic for the camera, but it's very infuriating because first of all, Adam admitted guilt. So it's not like we're trying to say he didn't deserve to do time or now, anything like now that. I've admitted now, admitted guilt, yes. However, however, the games that they played inside of the courtroom that day, two questions. What do you think it was in the courtroom that day? Do you think somebody got in the ear of the judge? Was it something with you specifically? Did they tell that guy who he was supposed to point out? What was it that made this so wrong, number one, that made this whole thing happen? And number two, was it something with your case specifically or is this a lot more common than we think? Hmm, first and foremost, the entire justice system is skewed toward the government. You know, from the beginning stages, when they put out a press release saying we have arrested so-and-so uh, based on these charges, like that's given as fact. I mean, from that moment on, like public perception is going to be skewed towards the government. You know that they're, I mean, the purveyors of truth. And honestly, the way that our system is set up is that the prosecutors are supposed to be the fact finders and ultimate purveyors of truth and, and the, the judge is supposed to be there as the referee to make sure that things go, well said. stay within the lines. Well said. And the defense is supposed to obviously provide that defense and make sure that you're portrayed in the best light. However, it's become all about wins and losses. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way for a very, very long time. So coming into this, there's already an initial bias. Unfortunately, this is far more common than we'd care to admit. Courts are just skewed against the defendant. Uh, and prosecutors have unlimited resources, right? It's the federal government, especially when you're, you're in federal court. State court is similarly skewed. So yeah, that's the challenge that you're, you're facing going into this. With my case in particular, there were some other things at stake. These cooperating co-defendants both ended up in WITSEC because they were testifying against others. So they needed to protect their credibility. And in order to do that, to, to make sure that they were established government witnesses, they obviously had to get a conviction in our case. So there was a lot more at stake there. And let's be honest. One, I was guilty. I'm sure everyone assumed I was guilty. That's still not well, right. It, it, it's not right, but this is the, the- That's their mentality. The mentality is the end justifies the means. Does, but that's and I'm gonna not say legal. I can, it's not legal. I'm gonna say I understand that from a human perspective. That's just how we're built, right? Some of those- That's how they could sleep at night. Well, what we, yes. What we know about inherent bias at this point, and there are certain deeper operating factors within us that, you know, are a little bit beyond our control. And it's important to acknowledge those because that's the only way that you overcome that. However, within the court, within the legal system, I mean, to think that people could be completely in bias and, you know, balance everything out, like that's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So now in hindsight, looking back, I can see why they may have leaned a little bit in a certain direction. I definitely don't agree with it, but that's the reality of the system. That's where we're at. And as you said, for us prior to my release to ever try and explain or talk about any of these things, I'm just that lifer complaining about the raw deal that I got and you know what I mean? Trying to make up stories on why I should get relief or be able to get back into court. This is a whole different perspective. We're past that. You know, I'm out now. I had no reason 
to, to bring up any of this or to, you know, tell it other than like it was. Are you kidding me? Okay, last thing, because this is getting long. We tell these stories to be entertaining, but also to teach you guys a lesson. So for many years, I mean, really until you got home, you always said in your case, you couldn't argue that because of the factors involved in your case with the mandatory minimum, et cetera. However, if somebody finds themselves in a situation like this, mm -hmm. and this is on record, is there anything they can do to fight this? What can they do moving forward with this information? Should they try to fight this? What is your advice to anybody going through it now? No matter what, uh, you have to remain positive. Whatever challenges you're facing, how seemingly insurmountable things may seem, if you're looking at the record and it feels like and it looks like things were stacked against you the whole way, if that's your reality, you still have to believe that you know it, it's possible to get the relief that you're seeking. Uh, you have to stay positive. You have to keep moving forward. And if, if you need better example of what's possible, I mean, look at our story. Mm. Few people believed in us and our ability to overcome, you know, seemingly insurmountable challenge, 213 years. I mean, if we did it, we're not the only ones. Mm. We can't be the only ones. So encourage you to stay hopeful, stay positive, And yeah, don't ever give up. That is, I think, the best advice and the best way to end this video. So if you guys are interested in seeing me tell the exact same story while masking my own face and letting us know who told the story better, it's gonna be him please click that video right there. Or you know what, where on the screen do you want it? Just point where you want me to link that video. Click that video right there. If you haven't already subscribed and you're interested in hearing more of our stories, click that little circle there or the red box below. We love you guys and we'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.